<laughs> okay, uh, we're recording. This is Wrong Speed Record Chat number 41. And we have Mr. Daniel P. Carter. How Hello. you doing? I'm good. Yeah. You all right? Good, yeah, yeah. Where, where are you? Um, uh, what well, actually, specifically, I am in the studio, like, uh, I have like a little studio at the end of my garden where I paint and record music and uh, hoard useless things. Like records. <laughs> Like records, yeah. <laughs> records and trinkets. And have you been recording your radio show there? No, I did. Um, during the first lockdown, I did. Um, I did like quite a few months of, of pre-recording it at home mm. um, because they didn't really want us going into new broadcasting house. And that um, fully sent me over the edge <laughs> because normally the whole of lockdown up to that point I'd, I'd just been I'd been quite lucky I, I it wasn't really affecting me um mm. because I'm I'm quite uh I'm kind of a hermit anyway because literally I just sit in here and as I said paint and and, and noodle yeah so um so that was fine but then uh, not doing the show live because I do it live normally um it yeah it started to send me a bit balmy because I was just like overthinking everything and like just tiny little things that no one's going to notice and it would just be like oh if i extend this bit here and loop it in and then crossfade it into there it'll be this incredible transition no one cared <laughs> um apart from me and then it and then i realized i was um slowly losing my mind by doing that and then uh kicked up a bit of a fuss and it turned out we were allowed back in the studio by that point anyway so it was a result yeah, because I see uh, Mark Riley was recording at home for about a year on his Six Music show. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't envy him that. I think I did like six, like I said, probably about six months, maybe. Mm, yeah. um, and Ken yeah. Bruce, and Ken Bruce. I listen to a lot of Ken Bruce at work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, are, are they pre-recording it or doing it live? Because I know a few people were doing it if they've got like decent internet speed, they can just do a do a show from home which is kind of cool to do it live i think yeah but ken bruce was live because uh pop master is the reason you listen to ken bruce of course you know? <laughs> but, but um well you know that of course and uh mark riley was recording a week in advance so he was recording tuesday for next tuesday oh okay yeah, yeah that's okay I, the thing i found would i would kind of it started to annoy me that there would be things coming out on a Friday and the show had already been sort of pre-recorded on, on, yeah, like a Tuesday or whatever. Yeah. Um, so by the time it, it aired on a Sunday, it was already behind things, which yeah, is kind of, I, nice. I've sent, I've sent you stuff before on the Sunday and you've played it that night. Yeah. Like, it's, it's awesome. well, that's, I mean, that's kind of how it should be. Right. I think. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, it's, my, my it's producer surprised. wouldn't think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, but also, but when I listen to your show, um, it sounds like you're standing up when you're recording it. Like it sounds like it's quite lively. Yeah, I am. Yeah, that's funny that you would notice that. Yeah, I do stand up. I can't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of people will do their shows just sat down, but I don't know. There's something about it. I feel like I would be. I mean, I only do a show once a week. I feel like I'd be a bit lazy if I was just sat down, <laughs> sat down yeah. doing it. Yeah. my feet up but whatever horses for courses i suppose yeah it does sound lively and you, you can tell it's it's um yeah it's, it's... that'll be all those energy drinks <laughs> there you go <laughs> <laughs> so, um how long have you done the the uh radio one rock show for them uh i think it's coming up for uh 14 years i think which is nuts, yeah. considering it was never on on the uh, <laughs> like bucket list of things to do. Like work in radio was never yeah. a consideration. But um, yeah, things just work out that way, don't they? Uh, but I yeah. love it. Oh well, totally. Like did um, like um, so we're roughly the same age, and um, I yeah. I messaged a few people today and last night saying that I was going to admit this on air when I speak to you now, and it is that um. 
Tommy Vance was more of an influence on me than John Peel. Um, That's great, though. And, 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 and because I was sort of 12, 13, 14 and would listen to the Friday Night Rock Show, as it was. Yeah. Like in bed. Yeah. And it would, uh, I would just get so excited listening to it. Like insanely yeah. excited. And then I would often fall asleep before it ended and be gutted and then woke up. My first thing I thought when I woke up the next morning was I could turn it on and it would start again. It was the, always the most disappointing thing ever. <laughs> I <couldn't. laughs> yeah, I just, it's funny, isn't it? I think, um, yeah, I used to listen to, to Tommy Vance all the time. And, but yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. It's, it's like to go to name check John Peel is obviously a lot, a lot cooler than saying about Tommy Vance in a, in a sense. And I, that sounds like a harsh thing to say. I don't mean it. I don't feel that way personally, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's nice to, to hear that you admit it, though. <laughs> well, well like, you know, I did end up, I do, I did listen to John Peel as well, to sort of yeah. not at that age, not at 12, 13, 14. No. These were my, no. I'm discovering music and rock and metal is my music. Like, you yeah, know, same here. Yeah. So, and like listening to him on a Friday night. And what was he called? He was called The Night Fly. Did he have a name? Did he call himself something? I don't know. Is it like for some reason? I don't think so. No, I don't know. I need. To, I should have looked it up. I've got a feeling he had some I had a, radio name. I, I had a weird, um, not weird, but I had a nice experience after doing the show for about. Um, I don't know. I must have been doing it for a few years, couple couple of years maybe. And I was on tour with a band, and their tour manager, um, Danny is Danny Vance, so he was Tommy's son. Oh, cool. And, um, and I think we were both settling up at the end of the night. Um, and, and the guy we were settling up with, who put the show on, said something about, um, said something about the rock show. And he, and he said, oh, I used to listen to Tommy Vance. And, and, um, and, and Danny was just kind of sat there quietly. And I went, that was his dad. And, um, and then we and then we started to have this conversation where he, he um, and I told him how much you know listening to that show influenced me as a kid and you know helped me find new things and um, and then he said some really nice stuff about me doing the show cool. um, after his dad um, obviously there was a couple of people in between but it was yeah it was a really nice thing to hear. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, I mean, obviously you're going to answer this yes, and, and I, I agree, but I'm going to say it anyway, just to sort of start the conversation. But how important, and do you still think radio is important? In the um, yeah, I do. I do, yeah. Um, and I think I think equally important is the fact that now it's transitioning with, um, like, the BBC Sounds app, so that everything that the BBC does as audio is now available in one place on, as, a, as a, I guess, like a on-demand sort of streaming thing. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's super important. And, um, it's funny that we, I was doing the show, uh, last Sunday and it was a co-host with Simon Neal from Biffy Clyro and, yeah. and he picked a bunch of songs as well. And, um, he picked this Imperial Triumphant track, which is, um, really oppressive kind of post black metal. So it sounds almost like a weird, uh, kind of metally Tom Waits at the start oh, really? and then goes into this blasting like fury <laughs> and uh, while it was playing the pair of us were just like you know uh, chatting a little bit in between because he was in Scotland and we had like a talk back thing so we could chat to each other yeah. and I said I'm glad you've picked a load of stuff like this because I know that his tastes are pretty eclectic and I know he likes a lot of really um I, I guess stuff people would consider to be quite extreme for the top, but what I don't know what they would expect his taste to be actually because that band's quite all over the shop anyway. But um, and I said I think it's really important to play music like this on national radio. Yeah. Um, and there's probably a bunch of people that are working a night shift and have Radio One on that would totally disagree. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it is in, but it is important, you know. Um, I to to go back to to peel you know you'd listen to things and the way he would choose stuff his tastes were obviously very eclectic and 
but but to have bands like electro hippies or napalm or whatever to do sessions it was really important oh yeah i think yeah well aside from anything else it was th those bands in particular your napalm uh heresy those sort of bands it would yeah. be their best recordings with the beat, beat certainly early on yeah i agree 100 percent. i didn't want to say that but yeah i agree <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah, super important. Um, so yeah, so I feel that uh, I actually messaged somebody at work. I can't remember what it was. I was playing the other week, but um, but I, I think I just messaged one of the guys that's quite high up at work who who loves metal as well, and I just said, you know, playing a twelve minute sort of post whatever song is is important to to be on the radio. I think. Yeah. Um, no, well, well I, I agree entirely, and, and and especially the um the sort of the specialist shows, like on, yeah. on the radio, like the, the daytime stuff is sort of, you know, like mass media or whatever, but the evening stuff, the specialist stuff, is really important, and that goes across all like the stations, Radio One, and all the way through yeah. to like, whatever else, Kiss and local radio and stuff is. Yeah, yeah I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things I used to do when I, I was so I'd listen to the Friday Rock Show. I did a paper round at the time. I was getting six pound a week from uh, uh, Mr. Patel. Was up on the corner there, and then that's better um, than I get now at the BBC. <laughs> yeah, I would love to know. But anyhow, um, um, <laughs> so the, the morning after, we would all get on the train because we live just outside London. Get on the train mm. and go to Shades Records. Oh, of course, yeah. And I'd love to know your. Uh, first of all, I want to show. I want to show uh, one of the things Shades used to do a lot. Would have signing sessions, and and yeah. uh, and, and one of if them, you say the band that I'm thinking of, it's going to blow my mind. It won't be. It, it almost certainly won't be. I I I, I, got, I had like th three or four. And irritatingly, I sold a lot of heavy metal records at one point because I took yeah. a lot of money I needed. But this one here, I kept, and it's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> no, no, because no. they, they signed, signed by Jizzy Pearl. Yeah, yes, Joe, it is. Buy me well. a... <laughs> <laughs> I kept it. And so we used to love going to Shades. Like yeah. it was a really exciting shop. I didn't, did you go there? Did you spend time there? Was yeah. Place? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, um, so I grew up in a little village outside of a town outside of Reading. Right. Um, so to go there was quite a big deal. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, th I, I, anytime anyone mentions Shades and brings it up, I always think of Sacred Reich. Oh, because shit. I remember one particular trip going there with um, like my oldest friend Jay and we went to, they were doing a sign-in. I think they were doing a sign-in. They were definitely in the shop anyway. And um, and uh, he was desperate to meet Wiley Arnett, who was <laughs> the guitar player in Sacred Rush. Um, and he got really cross because some guy kind of pushed in front of him and, and took up loads of time and then they all left. Oh, no. <laughs> So I always, any time I think of Shades, I always think of my mate Jay getting really pissed off that he didn't get to meet Wiley Arnett from Sacred Rush. <laughs> that was that was a big shock for us, that though. You'd go in there, on the on the uh, counter, there was an enormous, like, old, like, 1970s telly, and it was always showing videos, but mute, because the record, there'd be a record playing, and it would be like, yeah. you know, like Poison or whatever would be playing. But the video, I remember they had a DRI live video. It was DRI live at the Ritz. Yeah. I bought that. I bought that video purely on what it looked like. I didn't even know what it yeah. looked like. <laughs> I was like, oh, just, this video. <laughs> yeah, just carnage. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah, I think I think actually that guy that I was talking about, Jay, has that has that VHS as well because yeah. we used to watch it. Yeah. It's a slightly oversized box. <laughs> one of my memories <laughs> really irritating <laughs> but um yeah so we we would go there all the time like oh so it's tommy vance listen go there on the saturday like because we lived Buy in a town record. called yeah we lived in a town called berkhamstead right which is about yeah the other side of what like what it goes berkhamstead hemel watford london sort of thing so it was that train line yeah yeah and and weirdly like i don't know if you've got if you've got kids should i know them? yeah i've got two yeah, so uh, we were going into London when we were 13, 14, just getting on the train, going into London, the tube around, the record shops, going home. Yeah. And I think now, like, I, 
I can't imagine. Really. Yeah, there's no way. Yeah, there's no way. Weird, isn't it? It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Like, I, yeah, I, that's true. There's a, there's a bunch of things where I think back about childhood and just, you know, summer holidays when you were 10, where it'd be like, right, be back at half six. Yeah. And you just disappear into the woods. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, and just, yeah, and just get up to no good. And um, yeah, it's nuts, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I mean, I even got, I got mugged twice. And it was just like nothing. It's like outside Tottenham Court Road tube, someone came out with a knife and just took all my cash and I just went straight home. And then outside Ant well, went to wow. Amsterdam, went to Amsterdam for my 18th birthday. I got mugged <laughs> straight away outside the train station. <laughs> Welcome to the Netherlands. Yeah, we sat in Burger King for 48 hours and then came up. We had no money. Oh, mate. Total bummer. But um that's the worst. But we were allowed to do we were allowed to do it. It was really weird. Like I've got tickets, I've got yeah. gig tickets, or I'd go, I went to see Testament and Halloween and all these bands when I was like 14, Hammersmith Odeon and whatnot. I've still yeah. got tickets. I can't believe it when I look at them. I think, what? Like, yeah. yeah. I think my my first proper show was at Hammersmith Odeon, and it was um Testament was opening for I think it was An yeah, it was Anthrax on the Among the Living Tour. Right, here we so go. Testament were my First, is this what you're going to pull out now? I was going to pull out this record here. Because there I, you go. I want it to go. I've gone on record many times, but I'm going to go on record with you and say this is the best record from the Big Four. Wow, <laughs> that's a ludicrous statement. <laughs> <laughs> I love that record, though. But yeah, it's it's brilliant. It's so positive, like lyrically, yep. it's awesome. The rhythm section, like oh, Scott mate. Ian, Scott. the bass player, the drummer, like it's insane. Yeah, Scott Ian's rhythm playing is amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's what yeah, makes Charlie it. Charlie Benante is an incredible drummer. Exactly. It's yeah. what makes it. And for me, when I was, so I was listening to this, this came out, what, 87 ish? I would have bought it in our price around then, maybe. 80. Yeah. And um, yeah. Uh, only a, it took me a few years to realize that they weren't particularly entirely a thrash metal band. And they had come more from a New York hardcore world. And when you listen to like Chromax and put them back to back, they kind of yeah. together. Yeah, I was never a huge um, New York hardcore fan, to be honest, weirdly enough. Hmm. But yeah, I know what you're saying, 100%. Um, I actually did a podcast with Scott Ian uh, a while ago, and we, we spoke about that whole era. And he was telling me what it was like going to shows in New York. And because he was, as he said, the band was kind of on this, in this weird sort of space between yeah. hardcore and metal. Because, yeah. you know, Fistful of, Fistful of Metal is obviously very, very metal. But, yeah, um, but yeah there, there, were, there were those elements in there. And he said that, you know, they'd go to hardcore shows and, and they'd have to stand at the back by the door in case anyone kind of turned around because their hair was like this long or whatever. Yeah. I was just and, looking. I, I can't see it at the minute. But I know it's in here. I've got the, uh, oh, fuck, the, the uh, John Joseph Cromag book. Okay. Hmm. And he talks, he talks about that. He talks about anthrax and whatnot, going and see them. And he said it was a total yeah. for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy, isn't it, when you think now that it just feels like that tribalism is 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 really, it's a cliche to talk about, but it's very much gone, I think, to now, oh, yeah. as far as music tastes go. But even within genres that were so adjacent that you could get a kick in. Yeah at a show because you looked slightly more one way than the other oh my god yeah. it's nuts yeah because crazy I'm, isn't it it's the thing i really like reading i like reading about things like straight edge yeah I that like, book's great isn't it uh, yeah 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 I like, I like reading about it and i like reading about new york hardcore things sometimes more than i like listening to it because yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah um because yeah because the the way they went about their business in those days is is it's brutal. It still is a bit with the straight edge well, but it certainly was back. Yeah, real song. Yeah, it was. It was like the Warriors very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. God, I love that film. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um. So okay. So before, before you did, uh, ended up with radio stuff, and I know you still do play music now, but you were in bands before, okay? Um, yeah. So, uh, what? Here, here's a question. What do you have in common with the band The Internet? 
do I have something in common with them? Well, not really, but your band name does. Absolutely ungoogleable. Oh, ungoogleable, yeah. <laughs> Which is probably for the better, to be, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> Whereas uh, the, I think the internet called themselves that on the, <laughs> because they're young and current. Whereas you, the internet wasn't around when A started, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and we're old and not very current. I, I think the thing was, because um, I, I joined that band um, just after they'd recorded the first record. And I met them because I actually met them with the intention of uh, doing the artwork for the record. Okay. Um, so, but we ended up hanging out all day and just talking about, um, I think we just <laughs> ended up talking about like Faith No More and James Addiction a lot. And then, and then they, they knew that I played bass because I was in, I think I was still in Above All at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably. And, um, and yeah, and they knew I played bass and they went, oh, our bass player's leaving. And I went, your record's not even out yet. And they went, yeah. <laughs> and um, they said, do you want to do it? And I think I went and saw them. I think they were supporting Faith No More and that's kind of what sealed it for me. Mm. Um, even though I had friends with me going, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> oh, really? Why, why would your friends say that? Because they were... <laughs> Who, who knows? <laughs> they just went in, they went into it, I don't think. Right, right, right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was just thinking, oh, I'll talk with Faith more. Yeah. And we yeah. never did again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I, it, it, you got pretty big, like you did four albums, major label, whatever else. Yeah, yeah, it did all right. Had a moment. Um, it's funny, something I noticed that when, so I, I was in that band for, what like maybe eight years not yeah about eight years nine years and then I reached a point and it and I was always like you know I'd be out and it would be like oh there's that guy from A and then as soon as I crossed that eight years at Radio One it then became oh there's a guy from Radio One right yeah yeah, yeah. so that that was kind of a weird one but um I wouldn't uh, I probably I wouldn't be at Radio One if it wasn't for that band actually I think the, the thing was that when when we were doing that and we had a moment where things were going quite well, we did a lot of stuff with Radio One. Yeah. And um, I got to meet a lot of people. And then I just got a phone call out of the blue after the band was done. And somebody said, do you want to do you want to present the Radio One rock show? I was just like, yeah. How did this, what experience did you have before? Did they just like your voice? No. What's going on? None. Absolutely none. I think the thing was... Um, uh, there was an independent company because a certain amount of shows at, at, at BBC have to get fielded out to independents okay. so to show, you know, um, uh, yeah, to show that the whole thing isn't in like a headlock, I guess. Um, and um, this company was, I think, pitching to do the show. Well, maybe they had won the pitch. No, they couldn't have won it already. But they were pitching to do the show and they put a list together. They spoke to a bunch of people from, from that world. And, and I think a bunch of people said, oh, that guy who used to be in that band is really annoying because every time I meet him, he goes, what are you listening to at the moment? Have you listened to this? Have you heard this? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and I think they met, there was a list of like 14 people and we all did pilots. Um, and then they got cut down to about four people. And then we did another round of pilots. Um, and then it ended up with myself and my friend Katie. Um, we did like a, they, we did a pilot as a co-host because it got down to the two of us. And then I think they decided they just wanted it to be one voice in the end. And, and, um, and I got a phone call. I think I was on tour teching for someone. And I think I got a phone call going, oh, yeah, the job's yours if you want it. And I was like, oh, okay, great. When do I start? And they're like, a uh, week on Monday. <laughs> are you, and I've never done it. Are you still, friend of, are you yeah, still friends with Katie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like I was like, yeah, don't get her. I'll, I'll do <laughs> Um, But she was at, um, she did, I think she did Radio X and um, Kerrang Radio and worked at Kerrang as well. So no, no, no. he was in that world. I think that's why they probably paired us up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah, well, it's, it's amazing how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> I know it's crazy. I, the the thing is, I have I have been very lucky that things do kind of fall into place, um, and these really quite weird opportunities present themselves at different points in my life, and I just end up going, oh, that 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 could be interesting, and then I do that for a bunch of time, yeah. and it turns out quite well. I suppose. Yeah. Right, it's amazing. Not, um, not complaining. No. And so the other thing you do is art. Yes. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's what I studied. Yeah. And that's how I ended up in a band. <laughs> I ended up in two bands because of that, actually. I played in um, a bubble when they they were already signed to Roadrunner, but I, they were from South End and they were part of the South End hardcore scene. And because of a band that I played in, we kind of played with a bunch of those bands. Mm. So got to know them. And um, and they asked me to do, I think, yeah, I was, yeah, I must have been. That was when I was at St. Martin's. They asked me to do the artwork for their record, which came out. Um, it was the only one, out, the only album they did. Um, so I did the all the inside artwork for that. And again, their bass player left and I got asked to do that job and then the same thing happened with a as well met them to do the artwork and sounds like i have this machiavellian plan where it's like <laughs> i meet up with a band to, under the uh, guise of doing artwork for them and slowly ingratiate myself in and end up playing bass for them <laughs> yeah you're obviously just a nice bloke right hmm i don't know something about that but yeah <laughs> So St. Martin's College, that's a proper art place, and I've heard of that. Uh, only because you've listened to Pulp. <laughs> <laughs> that might be right, actually. Yeah, I don't really yeah. Know. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it's, it was, I guess it was considered to be one of the best art schools in London. And I, I did a degree there. But then, I, um, yeah, so that was the plan, because obviously you've been the same age as me. I'm sure when you were at school, the two things that I was kind of half good at and had any interest in was art and music right. um, and was told that neither of those were viable career options, <laughs> which Sounds is bad. true. Bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I always thought that if I go and do art, at least I can do something that I like doing and be involved in the periphery of it because I could do album covers. And... Mm. So that was, that was the plan. And then ended up, and, and at that point, we're still playing in bands and stuff and mm. throughout all of that. And um, who else have you done art for? Um, I have done stuff for... Did, did, um, I see, did I see Dillinger Escape Plan mentioned somewhere? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Um, I did a seven inch for them. And that happiness is a smile, I think it's called. I've got... A, Bunch of, I think we've got four or five copies of that, um, which I'm hoping will turn into eBay gold at some point. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I did Dillinger, I did him, I did Vision of Disorder, I did Hang the Bastard, uh, Black Foxes, um, Frank Iero, Behemoth, uh, Cradle of Filth, uh, my band Crocodile. Um, that one doesn't really count. Um, so who would? Um, a, a, a few others. Yeah, like Bosk. So, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's that B O S S K band, doesn't it? With the K at the end. Yeah. Um. So, like, would you say that album art influenced? I mean, it must have influenced you, like the twelve-inch vinyl formats. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very much so. I mean, I'm sure you would have bought, especially like when you first get into metal, you must have bought albums based solely on album art because Absolutely. a lot of times you, you know, you'd have enough money to buy one record, yeah. And so then you'd, you'd go through and then find a record with the yeah. art that looked the, the gnarliest generally. Well, here's here's the second record I ever bought, and you put and I bought it purely because I bought it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that it was in W. H. Smith's Birkenstead High Street, three ninety nine. Amazing. A fame reissue. Um, but yeah, like yeah. how exciting is that to like a thirteen or fourteen year old in the eighties? Yeah, Derek Riggs was was the man, wasn't he? Yeah. I, I know that um, 
that's how I got into metal actually my, my elder brother my eldest brother he joined the navy and then he would come back on leave with like these two massive boxes of cassettes and I would go through them and and that's kind of how, yeah I, I still put it down to it that's how I first got into metal because I, he had Iron Maiden Iron Maiden the debut again the artwork I was just like whoa yeah. and um and Highway to Hell as well because right. I looked at, I remember looking at the artwork and going whoa that guy's got horns <laughs> what's that about <laughs> um yeah so yeah it's super important in fact I've just started I get obsessed with things um with painting and paint to certain formats and on certain things like I always used to paint just on on paper and then mount them on wood and then recently I went into hobby craft uh when I was going to get uh um when I got my first jab and yeah. uh, there was a hobby craft next door and I went in and they had these um these birch panels that are 12 inches square perfect so I I've started painting on those um and yeah they're just they are you know that they are like an album artwork size so I've started doing a run of paintings on those but the, the problem with that is because I I do them and then go, oh, that would make an amazing album cover or like that would look cool for album art. Mm -hmm. But it's, I, I find, and I ha I've had this conversation with um, like John Baisley from Baroness, who obviously is an incredible visual artist. Mm -hmm. He always does stuff slightly bigger than, than, um, than an album. I mean, obviously his stuff now is getting much bigger because it's so intricate. Because I think that as soon as you shrink it, if you shrink something down, it tightens everything up and it, it makes the whole work look a bit more um, impressive and cohesive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the problem with painting on 12 inch square bits of wood is going to be that you won't get that effect <laughs> unless they're seven inches yeah. or a 10 inch. <laughs> or a cassette. <laughs> Yeah, your brother can bring it back from the navy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so actually, one of the I was going to ask who else influenced you, but before I did, I was just going to show who I think is one of the most whose art is kind of classic is uh, the Nick Blinko stuff. Uh, yeah, like rudimentary penai fella. Um, yeah, I, I love his. Like it's a lot to look at, which I quite I quite. Like, yeah yeah i don't know who yeah i think a lot of that call up um for me the 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 people that i look to now and still it blows my mind um is obviously all the larry carroll stuff that he did for the slayer albums okay um i just i just think they're perfect for the records mm -hmm. i think um I think Rain in Blood is one of the greatest metal album covers of all time. And I think the only thing that spoils it, I've actually got a copy there. I think the only thing that spoils it is the Slayer logo in the corner, personally. I just think the artwork is just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and I kind of went down a rabbit hole um, a while ago uh, and went through a load of his stuff because he, he was a serious fine artist and, and all his Slayer art was kind of this weird little partition that he did on the side because okay, yeah. after after that record they obviously used him for like south of heaven and and i think all their best album art is the stuff that he's done right. like seasons in the abyss and and christ illusion as well and they got him back to do that art. but it wasn't something he was particularly proud of he made these um very minimal paintings that are more textural and these kind of weird sculptures um that would look like kind of like a, I think they were called table sculptures that look kind of like a weird little spindly table with a kite nailed to it or something and it would all be painted like beige <laughs> but so he was he was more into that kind of that was his that was his fine artwork and the Slayer stuff was almost like oh yeah and I also do this but I just I just think he's incredible him he, yeah he's one of my favorite in fact I'm doing an album sleeve at the moment and when the band started talking to me about the kind of stuff they wanted, I said, oh, I'd really love to try and do a kind of Larry Carroll-esque, you know, rain in blood piece. So I started this massive painting um, 
the biggest painting because I always work sort of uh, to a certain scale like the the biggest I do before that would be kind of I don't know just over a meter square and this thing's a lot bigger than that and uh and it's on the floor in my studio here yeah. like a rug half no not even half finished and I walk in every day and look at it and go you shit bag <laughs> um and it just kind of lays there and taunts me because I have no idea how to finish it so that's why I've been doing this run of 12 inch square paintings to just kind of yeah. try and clear my head yeah there's a there's a saying that i think it was just a friend who said it because he tries to do uh, he does a lot of writing and he says you can't edit a blank page so the key yeah. is just to start and, and yeah and, yeah you know and then and then go with the flow and hope <laughs> yeah it's true yeah. but then the, the flip side of that from visual art i think is is like a clean white canvas or paper or whatever it is medium that you're painting onto is already perfect so anything that you then do to it is <laughs> making it worse <laughs> you are making it worse until you make it better right okay. and sometimes that that fight isn't uh, uh as easy as you would think it to be but yeah so anyway larry cowell is one of my favorite artists and dennis forkers kostromitin you know him oh, no, I don't he's a russian painter and a cultist who does stuff for so he did stuff for horseback um he did the cover of behemoths the satanist um yeah he does these kind of weird paintings that look like they've been done during a fever dream in fact i think he does do a lot of stuff from dream okay he like paints these visuals that he has the um kind of almost right. alleged trance-like dreams about I tell you, I, my dream last night was I dreamt about this, us talking, but I dreamt that I had to go to Radio 1 to talk to you, but I didn't have a top on, and I had to struggle, <laughs> and I was running around the corridors of, like, Radio 1, I've only ever been there once, so I wouldn't know, Look, desperately looking for a t-shirt to wear, because I was so conscious, I didn't <laughs> I'll paint that. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. So, um, yeah, I have <laughs> BBC anxiety dreams is a running theme of people I speak to I think my old producer used to have these horrendous dreams where nothing would work and people would be trying to get into the studio and stuff and I'd just be sat there going well you've got to deal with it <laughs> <laughs> but like if you're right. like band band most band people have those dreams as well like you're yeah. on a stage and all of a sudden you can't your dream is that you can't either remember any of the music or nothing's working there's some weird like issue that you can't deal with that's really simple <laughs> Yeah, which is much like real gigs a lot yeah. of the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's funny. It's true. Or just just looking at looking at a, a base and going, oh, yeah, what is this? Why are these bits of wood put together in this? Yeah, anyway. yeah, no, well, exactly, exactly. Um, let's uh, talk about records, right? Because that's what we're here for. Okie doke. We good. Uh, yes. So I send you a list. You've picked some records. The dog has turned yep. up to say hello, as usual. Amazing. Yeah. I should have brought one of the cats in. This is the bit that he likes. That's why he came in for this. He's going to judge me. <laughs> okay, we're going to ask him now. A record from your <laughs> favourite record shop. Talk about your favourite record shop. Um, okay. So... Um, I chose one, but there's actually three that kind of fit together. Um, and when you had Anthea on, it was nice to hear her talk about this shop because we both worked in it. Although I don't think I worked in there at the same time as her. Maybe we did. I know she used to come in the shop, but my memory's so bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everything's slightly blurred, but I worked in a shop called Green River Records in Reading. Um, which was in an arcade towards down towards sort of uh, Forbury Garden end of town, and um, I worked in there with uh, the two guys that ran it were, were guys called Paul and Pitt, and um, it was an amazing shop. And we would have, um, it, as Anthea said, there there was a ton of record shops in Reading at that time, but. Um, but Green River was like the cool sort of indie store. And I have loads of fond memories of being in there, but also a ton of regret because 
I'll look back now and go, or I'll look at things on Discogs and just go, oh, yeah. oh we had that in the shop. <laughs> Why didn't I buy that? Oh my God. So yeah, like all the first wave of um, Norwegian black metal stuff we all had in the shop and I would listen to it. I didn't really like it at the time just because it sounded so crap. Yeah. Um, but but now I realise that that's part of the beauty of it. But I think at the time I was very much um, off on another kind of thing altogether. But um, so yeah, so I used to get records from there, um, and the records I chose were um, the shellac seven inches. So um, I think. I don't know which one, which one did I choose? It might have been the Rude Gesture of Pictorial History, or it might have been, it might have been this one that's on um, Drag City, which has the Admiral on it, which is the bird is the most popular finger. Mm. Um, and I, I, I was a huge Albini fan at that point anyway. Yeah. Um, I thought everything he did, if somewhat questionable, <laughs> was, <laughs> was just untouchable. It was just incredible. Um, uh, and I loved the kind of weird mystique that there was surrounding him as well. Like you'd hear, you'd hear so many stories about, about people that kind of knew him or met him. And, and um, I, I'm sure a lot of that was kind of um, self-generated, this weird sort of mythology. I don't know, maybe not. Yeah. Um, but I, I just remember that when when he started Shellac, uh, I was overjoyed that he was doing a new band, mm. that I could actually say their name without feeling like a terrible person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but also, I just thought that the way they approached all the packaging was amazing. So, like, the weird kind of fold-outs that they had and, mm. you know, like, actually, like, you know, just the stamped sleeves, it felt very much like a lot of other bands that I was into, like a lot of the emo scene bands where it was, you know, there was that element of just hand stamping everything and having tons of little weird bits of paper with different kind of things Xeroxed onto them or pressed on and stuff. Um, and I really like that. Plus the band is just incredible. But um, uh, the bird is the most popular finger. I love the fact that the artwork was kind of a mock-up of what they wanted the artwork to be yeah so it would be like here this is going to be here and then this is going to be made of brass <laughs> and this bit's going to be granite and there's like a post-it note on their set with notes about it um and they never actually made it that was actually the cover which i thought was incredible yeah but then they did obviously have the um they have like a, a an actual photograph um that's kind of in the rep like sort of in the sleeve and when you take the photo out there's like a little key yeah, about um yeah. yeah it's just a like super like it really appealed to my kind of nerdy uh graphic design tendencies i just thought it was amazing but, um but, yeah they were a massive vinyl band weren't they, all their yeah i made a big I think when you yeah, was it was it Action Park? You couldn't actually buy it on CD, Action Park, but you could buy the record and you got a CD free with it. I think. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I know, but I know um, the one that's in the box. Is it some, uh, how many hertz? Is it five thousand hertz? What's that album called? Ten thousand. Yeah, a lot of hertz. <laughs> Shitload of hertz. That came. That came with a just a loose blank CD, like not even in a. Ah, yeah, maybe it was that one then. Not yeah, even the case it rattled. <laughs> <laughs> so much disdain for it, and rightly so. Um, is that is that your, yeah? Because as, as is that your thoughts on the formats? How do you work? How do you feel about? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Because having grown up in that era, I, I made a terrible error when I was a kid of buying loads of stuff on cassette. Right. Because I had like a Walkman. Hmm. Um, which is a portable tape player, yes. uh, much like an iPod. <laughs> Hello, but, um, kids. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so I would go into like a lot of places like HMV or whatever on um, on uh, 
Tottenham Court Road and I would go in and I'd like buy the Fugazi albums as they came out on cassette so that I could l- be listening to them as I walked out the shop. Yeah. Um, and now I have nothing but regret because I'm like, I wish I had those all on vinyl, all the records that I got in that era on cassette. I wish I'd just bought on record because I could have just taped them at home anyway. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But um, yeah. Um, and then CDs, obviously... I actually got rid of my entire CD collection about four years ago, which was like this incredibly liberating thing because it was just ridiculous. It was so many. And 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 because I get sent music constantly for work, yeah. a load of it would be stuff that um that would that would get played on the show and but it would be something that I wasn't then gonna listen to much. No. So I just just had this pile, like a you know, like a, a shipping container's worth of, of CDs that that rarely got listened to, and then it got to the point where I realised I didn't have a CD player, and my car couldn't play CDs, and I was just like, why have I got all of this stuff that I can't listen to? I mean, I've I can just listen to it on any like listen to it on my laptop or whatever, but and. That was when I then started collecting vinyl again, because there was a whole period where I just stopped during that whole era of, of CDs. I would bet I would get very little stuff on vinyl at that point. And now I'm trying to sort of get a lot of those things back. Yeah. And a lot of things as well during that era didn't get vinyl releases, certain things anyway, which is why, as I said, before we started, I, I'd been, sort of contemplating starting a label to, and and just doing reissues of things that I wanted on vinyl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's um, it's one of the, yeah, like, what, give us an example of something that... Uh, uh, Bart Market stuff, for example. I love that band. In fact, I just got, um, a mate of mine just sent me the Easy Listening record a couple of days ago. He found it in a, in a second-hand shop. It was like a tenner. And he was like, do you want this? I was just like, yes, please. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I love Bart Market. Um, and I think that Elron and um, the Lard Room EP are two of my favourites from that era. And I think I think Elron only came out, I think Man's Ruin did like a small limited run of it when it came out. And they're like two or 300 quid now. And I do not have that kind of money to spend on records. No, it's a conversation we talk about a lot. Like me, me and people of my my age or our age, like yeah, how we were we sort of like I continued buying records through the dark times. So if it didn't get released on record, I didn't really pick it up. So, yeah. So there's a lot of things that came out in like the '90s and early 2000s that I bought, and now I'm sitting on, and some of them are just like really valuable records that I don't really listen yeah. to. I'm scared of selling. <laughs> um, weirdly. It's odd. Like, I, I don't know why. You haven't got any Bart Mark, have you? I don't know. I might not have, but it's just one of those things where I sort of... I'll trade you if you do. <laughs> just get attached to these things. Don't I get attached to it? I can't yeah. get rid of them. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny, isn't it? But yeah, so there's... Yeah, there's a few things from that era I'd like to do. Um... But who knows? Um, maybe I will get it together and, and do it. But I have kind of got enough on my plate at the moment. If I want to do it, I want to do it properly. So. Yeah. Do you think licensing those things is easy? Would be easy. Um, I actually looked into it because um, there was a few that were um, that are now owned by Universal, and I started on the process where you have to petition them, you have to list what when it came out, and then how many copies you want to press and what you're thinking of doing with them and and blah 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 um but then uh it kind of fell by the wayside for a minute for various reasons right yeah yeah so some label i think in my brief experience of trying to do that over the last year um some labels aren't keen to respond respond Really, or the, the trail can run cold very quickly. In the, in yeah, the few things I've tried to like go. Oh, I think this should still be on vinyl, and I get in touch, and it's just like a web of sort of. I don't, I don't, well, 
I, th I think what it might be, or my feeling is that um, you point out to somebody that they have something that they have no idea that they own. Right. Yeah. And you go, this is a beautiful thing. I would love to, yeah. to press it onto vinyl. And then they go, oh, oh why would somebody care about that? <laughs> and then, and then the next thing you know, so the Bart market thing, and this is probably pure coincidence, but when I said to them that I wanted to do like three Bart market records on vinyl, um, they suddenly appeared on Spotify within about a month and a half, which that's, is, <laughs> that's probably just a weird coincidence. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but they weren't on streaming before that. I have a very similar story about a band that I probably won't mention until we stop recording and I'll tell you afterwards, where I asked <laughs> if I could record, I, I wanted to release a live album by this band. I was like, let's do it. Mm. Like, they, they haven't been going since, they, they started in the late eighties and stopped in the mid to mid nineties. They did mm. about three albums on a uh, particularly big UK heavy metal label. Um, mm. And then they stopped. And I was like, I'd love to do a live album by that band because I have that big influence on me or whatever. Got in touch with the label. They said, no, I wasn't allowed to release anything by them. And I was like, oh, like, okay, that's what, you know. And then within about six weeks, they announced that they were reissuing their debut album. Mm. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, but as annoying as that is, Uh, who knows? Maybe the things that we we would like to own will get made by somebody else, and it won't cost us a ton of money. And maybe look at it that way, try and look at a positive in it. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's annoying. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely want to know who it is now, so you can tell me afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Make a note. Remind me. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, a record with memories. Um. So I did choose one initially. Um, which was going to be uh, Evergreen, um, Seven Songs, uh, which came out on Anomaly and, well, and Wild Boy in like, uh, I don't know what year it was, like 90, it doesn't say. This is the, this it says, says you a lot about memories, doesn't it? Can't even remember when it came out. Um, what? The thing was, uh, I really loved this band and, and I had, uh, I think I, I got a cassette of it off of um, Andrew, who used to sing in Fabric. Okay. And he gave me a cassette of this record and um, I totally fell in love with it. And, and it really reminded me of that whole era. Um, and... It, it became one of those records which is notoriously hard to find and get a copy of. And they became more and more expensive. Um, and then I, I listened to the cassette until it was ruined. Um, at that point, I don't think it was on, I think, you know, things get put on YouTube. I don't think it was on there. And I'd looked on Discogs and it was ridiculous money. Um, and they did three seven inches um these last days which was on i think this one was on gravity yeah um which is i think you can still get hold of they did a split with still life which was amazing um that was on anomaly as well and then they did uh this one that was on wrenched um so i had those and would listen to them still and then i was talking to andrew probably a couple of years ago and I don't know how we got onto it and I went have you still got that evergreen record and he was like yeah 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 mm. and I was like you still don't want to sell it do you and he went I think he was moving so was probably trying to clear out and it sounds again like I'm this shitbag opportunist <laughs> it wasn't that way honestly <laughs> I said I would buy it off him if he wanted to sell it and he sold it to me so um so this is a, a, an amazing record from that time. It's kind of twinkly, um, but slightly chaotic emo. I think the bass player was in Antioch Arrow. Yeah, okay. um, and the drummer joined Bright Eyes afterwards, I think. Um, and then uh, the guitarist singer, Aaron Calvert, 
um, did a bat did a band afterwards. Something E I, I think. Anyway, but it's a great record. But then I did think afterwards this morning as I was going through records that the, the record that probably holds some of the most important memories for me is Sultans of Sentiment by the Van Pelt. Love that record. Ah, it's I think it's the perfect emo record. Yeah. Um, and I mean that in the best sense. Um, it's just, if anyone doesn't know that record, it is immaculate. It sounds like the most lush, beautiful, warm, uh, I guess emo or indie rock, however one you want you want to view it, with um, spoken word, I, I guess, delivery, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a time zone. Yeah. The, the guitar line in that, is it um, uh, the Kill the Cat song? Uh, Nansen killed a cat. The guitar line in it. Like, yes. I can sit and play that just I, I, badly. I can sit and play that all night long. It's just so yeah, <laughs> Yeah, so amazing. But when I got, I again, I had a cassette of that record. It came out on Gurn Blanston in like 97-ish. Um, and it was just, a, just before my son was born. Right. So... Um, we bought our first flat and we were moving to Walthamstow and I would go to this flat that was like a total shithole and would just play that um, cassette over and over while I was desperately trying to make this house livable for my wife that was literally about to have our, have our first kid and then move in. So I, was, I had this like just whirlwind of anxiety and emotions of trying to get everything ready um and just listening to that record on repeat which probably wasn't a good <laughs> probably was a good idea as an aside is, but, is that a re, is that a reissue you've got that yeah <laughs> no i no, 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 no i only ask it because it's obviously come in the post and whoever sent it to you didn't take i know it right you. like Look at that. Is, i know i hate that so to be fair, um, so it came out on uh, La Castagna in 2017 and they sent me this. Um, I actually, they actually did, I think they've done all, they did the two albums like um, Stealing From Our Favourite Thieves, this one, Sultans of Sentiment, and they did another record called Imaginary Third, which was a bunch of songs that they'd never released. Yeah. Um, and they're all great records. This one's just untouchable. But they sent me it and I was so excited to finally have it on vinyl mm. and it turned up split and I was distraught <laughs> and I messaged them and they sent me another copy. Um, so they sent me another one for free and packed it beautifully. Yeah. Um, it's just, just incredible. Um, Anyone that doesn't know yeah. that band needs to pick up this record. They, they were... Um, the band they were in beforehand was a band called Native Nod, yeah. yep. who was um, very similar as well. Um, spoken word, quite uh, frenetic, but um, really beautiful as well. There's a band actually, there's a band called um, Now Here or Nowhere, which came out um, probably about, oh God, my concept of time's terrible. Probably about eight years ago, Okay. Um, uh, and it came out on uh, 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 I can't remember. Um, but it was really similar. If you if you love this record, yeah. but the guy the guy does spoken word, but it's way more like whereas um, it's not Chris Leo, is it? Who? Which one is it? It's one of the Leos. It's the singer, isn't it? Ted. Ted. Uh, Yes, well, it's one of them. Tyler Crystal Ted. I'm terrible, sorry. <laughs> um, whereas his vocals are very, um, they're all spoken word, aren't they? But they, um, this Now Here record is almost like, it's not, it's not hip hop, but it's way more, um, again, it's spoken word, but the, the delivery is a, has a, is a lot more rhythmical, right. like almost like beat poetry. And it's, um, it's fantastic. I fell in love with it as soon as I heard it because the music sounds so much like the Van Pelt. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really good. Um, 
yeah, when you and were, it, um... it was n nice to hear a bunch of kids that clearly had that record and were like, this is going to be the blueprint for what we do for this thing, but we're going to do it slightly different and do it this way. Yeah, I like it when that happens. I think sometimes, yeah. sometimes I think um, that uh, new music comes out and if you're of an age, you can hear where it's possibly come from, that they might not... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but <laughs> so new music comes out. You can hear that it comes from you, you're like, oh, this sounds a bit like the Van Pelt. But for them, it might have been filtered in a different way to get to them. They might not even be aware of the Van Pelt. It might have gone through two or three other bands to get to them. And it's, I, I yeah, can't... I know what you're saying, but I think it's unmistakable. It's it's I'll send you a link afterwards. Yeah. It's so great. Okay. Yeah. Um and it's very, um, yeah, it's just brilliant. But um, I actually messaged them and was slightly gushing about it. It's one guy, pretty much. Um, and he was like, yeah, I love that band. I like that. So, yeah. <laughs> when, but, so you um, moved into Walthamstow in 97, is what you say, right? 97, 98. Yeah. So around that time, um, the main guy from Van Pelt was in the laps. Yes. I saw them play at... Um, where did they play? They did they play? They played in Camden, didn't they, at the Dublin Castle? Yeah, that's. I was gonna say I was at that gig. And yeah, me too. Yeah, and they played that gig with Dalek. Yes. Yeah, that was, that, that which was an I awesome thought, gig. Yeah, like because the, they're on the same label, they're both on Gurn Blanks. Yeah, the Dalek EP was on Gurn Blanks, and that came out then. And the yeah. album was on Gurn Blanks as well. So they toured together. I, I assume they toured. Whether it did more than one day, I don't know. But that yeah. gig, I, um, I, it really stuck with me, that gig. It was great, wasn't it? Didn't they do a couple of... Did they do the speeding train at that, or am I imagining it? I know that there was a couple of them, weren't there, that had been in the Van Pelt? Because wasn't... Um, was Toko Yasuda in the laps? I think so. And, and, and yeah, because yeah. she played bass in, in on the second Van Pelt record. They're doing a new record at the moment, you know? What, the laps? No, the Van Pelt. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're recording at the moment. I started following them on Instagram, and um, and we've messaged back and forth a few times. And, um, yeah, yeah, so they're working on a new one right now. In fact, it's probably finished recording. Yeah, I know um, so, Gringo Records in Nottingham put out a live album. Ah, oh, was that who put out the... Is that the Imagine Me Third, then? I don't know, it's a live album, and it's, I think it was recorded in Italy, although I could be wrong, and I know that someone will be watching. Spain? Or, or was it Italy? No, you're right, I think it is Italy. I keep I, While we're talking, I keep wanting to go over to my records, because I know I've got it, and just be like, mm. um, yes, I do have that record as well, it's wicked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, um, so yeah, just, just about that Dublin Castle gig, I loved the fact that it was the Laps doing their thing, and Dalek doing their thing. And it just yeah. it didn't feel wrong <laughs> that no. those two things were playing together. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about how tribalistic things were with like the, the Cro-Mags and the Anthrax people wouldn't have bonded yeah. with whatever. And you think, God damn, it's so similar musically, really. And, yeah. And with Dalek and the Laps playing together on the same label. And it's just was like, that's oh, perfect. If Dalek sounds like, Public Enemy meets My Bloody Valentine, or certainly did then. And, yeah, but it fit well. I thought it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was a great gig. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's interesting because we were moving to Walthamstow at the same time as you as well, so it was pretty weird. Oh no way. Yeah, because um, yeah, we just had our first gig. I, we had a first gig two thousand, but we moved to Walthamstow as well. So I think yeah, it, I think it was the route everyone took back. That's <laughs> the only place. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, and just, uh, I won't get into that, but yeah, I wish we kept ours. Whew, the flat prices there now are ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, bargain find. This was quite recently, actually. Um, I don't want to say where it is because I feel like I might have discovered a little treasure trove, uh, <laughs> but there's a secondhand record store there and the guy does record fairs and... He mainly sells like, I think he does really well on like kind of Bowie and Beatlesy type stuff, that kind of era. And um, 
but I would go in there and there is a metal section, but it's all very kind of eighties hair metal and then a few other bits and pieces. But then I was looking through the seven inches and I found a big stack of black metal, seven inches, totally unreadable, like illegible logos. So I was like, I have no idea what half of these are. Um, but I was like, how much are these? And he went, you can have 10 for 25 quid. I was like, amazing. So I grabbed a bunch of those, some of which on getting home and looking into are quite spicy and probably ones that I didn't, wouldn't want people to know I have. So they'll probably go back. <laughs> um, as is the way of certain black metal bands, I guess. Um, but amongst the seven inches, uh, I found this. And I said to him, uh, how much do you want for this? And he went, £2.50. I went, sure. Uh, yeah, OK. Is it um, Revelation? Yeah. Uh, I, mm, it is Rev. I don't think it's first press, actually. Uh, still oh yeah maybe it is actually yeah um but yeah, yeah it's that. like unfortunately i mean what am i talking about i've got it for two pound fifty <laughs> but like whoever owned it has got a biro and like gone around high hopes and hold your ground <laughs> and just like kind of written on the back of the sleeve weird <laughs> but that's fine yeah um so i think as far as like bargain finds go because like i said there wasn't a lot of the new york stuff that i was into at the time there were certain things but i was probably way more into emo -y stuff i guess and yeah. what was to become emo -y stuff like a, a lot of the um yeah um let the dog out so so yeah so to, so it is shit that i didn't own it beforehand but then also wasn't prepared to pay the money people wanted for it so it's then when i found that for for that price i was like wow yeah. here's here's a thing and it's a it's a book i show a lot and it's the uh, mm -hmm. sam mcfeet's book singer from born against yeah um, yeah yeah yeah. I, I haven't read the book though uh thoroughly recommend but there's a whole chat he, he was he does art for things because he does a whole piece in here about the style of artwork that those New York hardcore bands had with their logos and what it, he really, he really slagged them off. But <laughs> that whole kind of varsity vibe, is that what like kind of college yeah. collegiate look? Yeah. In fact, he uses that word and a whole bunch of swear words. It's really brilliant. But, oh. but, I, <laughs> but I actually quite liked the identity they had in a way. Just, yeah. It was, it was really, it felt strong to me, like Gorilla Biscuits, Judge. All, all those yeah. soft bands had that sort of one logo. All, all the yeah, all the youth crew stuff was very much of a yeah, yeah like a certain aesthetic on it. Yeah, like um, do you, do you buy into that? Do you buy into aesthetic stuff with artwork? Like when you yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as I was saying earlier, there's a load of records I I got purely based on how they looked and and the kind of vibe. But then I also would fall in love with things like. I don't know, bands like Nation of Ulysses was just, I, I love that band because they had that such a strong aesthetic to it. Yeah. And it was, it was this, and it was shtick as well. But at the same time, you could tell they were serious and meant it. And, and, but at the same time, it was all very tongue in cheek. And I love that, that they put so much thought into everything and everything they did after that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, um, like the, those... the Cupid Car Club 7-inch as well, with like it would have the different things in it. I just thought it was very cool and well thought out. Yeah, he was, he was, a, he was a clever bloke with that, Ian Spinonius or whatever, yeah. Those, those, yeah. Two, those two Nation of Ulysses records in particular, uh, Plays Pretty yeah. Baby and whatever, that they just... Five point plan to destroy America. Exactly. Is it five point? Yeah. Yeah. They, they um Yeah. You sort of 13 point plan. How many point how many points? 13 point plan? <laughs> what are we 
I'm getting mixed up with five year plan by DRI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they um yeah what was i gonna say oh yeah about the i wanted to go back just quickly to the um uh the politics of certain black metal bands and um yeah um obviously we agree it's all wrong so when it comes to like playing songs on the radio i know from the couple of times that you've played songs that i've been involved with you've asked for lyrics up front yeah to make sure we're not like wrong in any way with what we're saying <laughs> yeah prefer that would be amazing to not to not be the guy that's that uh, all of a sudden hauled over the coals for supporting some terrible band although i'm sure you could probably find that in a bunch of stuff but um yeah i, I just feel like and it's and it is bad but i feel like i'm overly cautious when it comes to black metal yeah um, so yeah, I, I do have to kind of try and make sure there's no, yeah, just wrongness involved. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. That that scene is. Um, yeah. I don't know how rife it is, but it's pretty rife. So. Um. Yeah, I, I guess so. But at the same time, you, then you get into the argument of like, can you separate art from artist? I mean, I'm not going to sing about the musical benefits of certain bands but you know um yeah let's just leave it <laughs> yeah i know it's awkward it's awkward it's, it's it is it is you certainly it's don't a, want to be it's a minefield and you don't want to be recorded saying it <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah a record bought on tour uh so a lot of the touring i did was during that whole cd era mm -hmm. um and then records um I get really weird about them being perfect. So hence the whinging email to Le Castagna <laughs> about when the Van Pelt album turned up. But um, so I, I didn't really buy an awful lot of records on tour, to be honest with you. I mean, CDs, yeah. Um, but yeah, records, I didn't like shifting them around. So I started thinking about stuff that I bought whilst, I guess, could be classed as being on tour or doing shows and stuff. And I remember um, Crocodile played with uh, Voivod at the Underworld. And I walked down to, um, it's all ages, isn't it, in Camden? Just around the corner, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, near the back of um, Coco, isn't it? And I bought the, uh, the Gloss demo on uh on seven inch i think it's when i bought it anyway i'm pretty sure i bought it from there that time but i could probably run but um i just think that they're um those two seven inches are incredible I mean, just raging raging hardcore um and i just thought they were perfect and i like the fact that when uh, bigger labels started to show an interest because they realised that there was this band coming from the LGBTQ plus community that were making this incredible ferocious music I think Epitaph really were keen to sign them, I, I think it was Epitaph and the band went, oh we don't want all this attention, we're just going to break up <laughs> which, I, which I thought was just so yeah. I thought it was awesome yeah. Um, and terrible, <laughs> but um, yeah, I th I'm pretty sure I got that then. That's a great record. Um, and then I did pick up another, which was when I was, uh, I think I'd gone to see uh, Turbo Negro were doing a show in Oslo and there was a little record store there. And I got, um, I found that uh, litany fucked up um, for that. That doesn't really count as being on tour. I, so yeah, I, well, no, I guess it's, gloss. It's, yeah, I, um, the on tour thing I know is I, I speak to a lot of people who've never toured, so it's 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 good just to pick up records when you're just on holiday. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. But, um, but mainly because it's good to go to record shops outside of your world, isn't it? That's kind of what. Yeah. You're in Oslo and you're in the record shop. It's a one-off chance often, isn't it, to go to these places? It's like, have to yeah <laughs> yeah that's why I, I used to love 
every time I go to LA, I would always go down to Amoeba and I mean, it's, it's almost a cliche to say it, but you could you just spend hours in there and go through stuff and, and find some real treats. Um, I've said it many times. I've not been... My ambition is to go to Amoeba. I've never been there. I have that ambition. Ah, yes. Well, they, it's moved now, hasn't it? There's a new... I think there's a, there's a new store. Um, it's moved from where it was. My, to do with Amoeba, my... Uh, bucket list is to do uh what's in my bag i would love <laughs> i really want to do that uh, to the point what? where i actually messaged a mate who used to work there and i was like yeah. who do you know is still there um, one of the yeah. reasons i started doing this is because that's exactly what i'd love to do i'd love yeah. to know what's in my bag for me but you know what you should watch the Stuart mogwai episode of this because he talks about i haven't watched that one yet i saw it yet i saw it last night but i literally i yeah. was watching them in bed and, and i didn't get around to it uh, he talks this is about good. The what's in my bag for Mogwai. And um, it's, it's quite a revelation that I didn't realise that he comes out with, which uh, kind of uh, huh. a little bit. And it was essentially that you still have to pay for the records. <laughs> oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> which he didn't know. <laughs> oh, he didn't know that prior to doing it? No, it's the other <laughs> Walking around going, whoa, look at this super rare pressing of... Uh... <laughs> Wow, yeah, that would be a kick in the balls at the end of it, wouldn't it? Like, you... like a $500 sort of oops. Wow, <laughs> not, you must get, do you not even get a discount? You got $30 off. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <I'm> like... <laughs> All right, I'll bear that in mind if I do ever get to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, just quickly on the uh, Matt Gloss band. Hmm. Uh, at least one of them ended up in this band. Yes, which I think is wicked as well. Yeah. Um, it's it's a lot more um, uh, not serrated. What do I mean? It's, yeah, it's a lot rougher, isn't it, than gloss? It's more kind of more discharging. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's cool. And I think um, I think a couple of them have done stuff with the Here's Collective as well. Do you know that band? Oh no, I don't. No, no. Oh, that's awesome. It's uh, It's got two members and then um, they have other artists from different bands um, uh, come and do stuff with them. And it's kind of noisy, metallic, hardcore-ish, I guess. Right. Um, it's fantastic. There's a couple of um, live shows on YouTube and it's um it's just like i watched one of them recently and you know when you when you're at a gig and it starts to go and you're like oh and you just feel super energized and want to get involved <laughs> um just watching the youtube was like that it was like this is incredible oh, what's the um, band called again here's collective h-i-r-s um okay and i think I think uh, because they're a collective and they have people from other bands come and do stuff with them, they've had, um, uh, yeah, members of Gloss. Uh, I think Shirley Manson from Garbage actually did some stuff and Laura from Against Me, uh, Martin from Los Crudos. Martin, yeah, Martin, right? Martin yeah. Crudo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so bad with names, I apologise. But... Um, yeah, and so they would have all these people come in and work with them. But they're, I think they've done one, maybe two albums so far. And there's another one due, uh, I think, the end of this month. And it's called The Next 100 Songs. And it's like a collection of songs from comps and stuff. And it's, it's yeah, I think it's going to be like 100 and something song. But r really great. Really great. Let's check them out because it's fascinating. Yeah, you're right about the whole two seven inches. Epitaph come along offering 50 grand or something. Like, yeah, oh, is like that what it was as well? Yeah, I, only because I looked it up. I'm not like a massive knowledge, but I do love those seven inches. So they, yeah. their little story fascinates me. They put those records out themselves, right? And they're just keeping them in yeah. place. So they're not even, they're not of value, which I like as well. They're just keeping them available. So you can always get a survivor, which, and they're, they're brilliant documents of a little world that is. I never saw them live, of course, but again, if you watch it on YouTube, it's mm. so exciting to watch them. You're like, oh man. Like, yeah, <laughs> amazing. Absolute crest of a wave stuff when you watch it. Yeah. yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. A uh, record that people wouldn't think that you would like. Um, I initially, again, I've changed my mind on what I told you I was going to choose. <laughs> um, and this probably isn't that much of a surprise. It's not really like, oh, I've never heard of Kate Bush before. Do you know what I mean? But um, it's one of my favourite all-time records. And, well, the ninth wave in particular, which is the B-side of The Hounds of Love. Mm. which is the greatest concept album ever made. Ever made. Okay. Just putting that out there. <laughs> um, I just... I'm in love with that record. Like, that I can not sing its praises enough. I just think it's absolutely perfect. I mean, the whole album's incredible because it's obviously got, like, the hits on it. But the B-side is just unbelievable it's a magical piece of music the whole thing um and my wife is a massive kate bush fan as well and like we nerded out we obviously when she did that um before the dawn talk that wasn't a tour that run of shows at hammersmith Odeon mm. or apollo or whatever it is now that was a bats apollo hammersmith <laughs> um we went on the first night and it was just um yeah just so powerful and moving and I just sat there crying for the first three songs which is fine um, but um, yeah I am that guy um, about her is the mystery, she's still got mystery to her she's in yeah. mystery how's that possible yeah I know right it's, I think it's fantastic and I mean obviously she hadn't played any shows for like 30 years or something after I think the last tour she did, I think one of the lighting rigging guys died. I think, okay. I think, I think he fell, and and I and I think that was the end of it for her touring. I don't know if that was. The, I might be getting that story wrong, but I'm sure that had something to do with it. So then she never did shows. Um, so when they got announced, and it was. It was like theatre, basically. It was there were these vast sets involved, and there were different sort of um, acts within the show. And one entire section of the show was the Ninth Wave. Um, so as the songs played out, there were you know revolving sets like in a the theatre, and there were bits where there was dialogue, and um, in the bit in um, uh, watching you without me there was like a scene where, because that song's about, because the whole thing, do you know the story of that? No, no, say, say, yeah, just <laughs> it. Okay, so the whole story of the ninth wave is, is the idea of somebody being uh, not ship, well, yeah, kind of shipwrecked, I guess, and lost in an ocean in with like a life jacket on. And everything that goes through their mind while they're kind of floating out there thinking they're about to die. Um, and... And each song kind of takes in different aspects of that period while they're in there. It's like the, the track Waking the Witch is like her um, kind of falling asleep and get going under the waves. And it, and it creates this sort of idea of a, of a witch being dunked. And, it, and she's like, has all these people screaming at her like she's at a witch trial. But then after that, there's a song called Watching You Without Me, which is about her sort of having this weird sort of out of body experience and seeing her family kind of going, should have been like, should have had a call by now. She should have landed or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so as she's be like there, before she performed that song, there was like this bit where there was a guy and a kid sort of sat watching telly talking about what they were going to have for dinner and why hadn't their mum called yet. And as she started singing the song, she was kind of appearing in different parts of the set, singing down to them. It was amazing. Yeah. So good. Wow. Give me goosebumps thinking about it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and there's another bit where one of the songs finishes and um, and there's like the sound of a helicopter and somebody screaming, get out of the water. And then so when that bit came up on the set uh, to show this, this weird part of the lighting rig came down and was like sh shining, got almost like searchlights onto the crowd and it was like blowing air down as the sound of this helicopter was really oppressive. It was amazing, super immersive. It was so cool. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I could 
could clearly go on about that all day. No, no, that's cool. um, do, you, do, you have, um, do you have other bands that you and your wife have bonded over in your life? I mean, we have a few um, that are just like, for some reason, we're just so connected to these. I don't know. Do you have any? Yeah, what ones? Uh, well, Guided by Voices, weirdly. Okay. One of the bands we saw loads when we were first getting together. And they're just yeah. a band that was just, we don't like buy all their records or anything, but like there's certain records of theirs that we just listen to. And it's like, oh, like it's, you know, a band that we saw together a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. I, I mean, other than, other than Kate Bush, probably The Cure. Um, and then, yeah, that's probably it. Think yeah. your, does your taste veer more sort of uh, that way and your wife's more that way then? And it's just like two in uh, the middle. <laughs> yeah, I guess we kind of meet in the middle with more kind of indie type stuff. Mm. And she likes a bit of punk and a little bit of metal. But um, um, yeah, it was some more kind of indie stuff that we kind of sort of connected over mm. when we first met. I mean, we, we met when we were like 17, I think. So, um, yeah, but um, yeah, Kate Bush and The Cure are the two like real, like real it. ones. I like, so. it when I like it when you have a couple, of, it's nice. I think. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah, but um, how yeah, was, so Hammersmith, the, Hammersmith Odeon, did you say that was those gigs? Yeah, or the yeah, or the Labatt's Apollo Hammersmith, or whatever it, it, it was at the time. I used to like, yeah, drive into London on the uh, A M4 A4 right there. And it's the flyover mm. over Hammersmith, and you yeah. can see the Hammersmith Odeon as it was then. And like, if you yeah. buy any of the uh, like live at Hammersmith Odeon videos, like Anthrax did one, didn't they? For the yeah, 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 yeah. The evil N video, evil uh, Nicker Fesson or whatever it was. Oh no, that was the song, wasn't it? The yeah. video was yeah, yeah, yeah. But with video backwards, and yeah. like they would always have like the the, the like a, like an old school cinema where they have the band name written on. I used to yeah. love that. I used to love it. And if you drove over well. the flyover, you'd see it. It would. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> they did two nights on that tour, didn't they? Because I went on my birthday oh. and they played. Um, one of the dates was, yeah, yeah. They were both in November. Yeah, I remember going on my birthday. And I think the reason I was allowed to go and that, that was my first proper show um, was because of that, because it was my birthday. So, 87? <laughs> I think... Yeah, 87, maybe 88. Yeah. Uh, maybe 87, because I remember going to see Metallica there on Justice, and that was 88, and that was after that. Right, right, right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe 87. I think you might be right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the last one I've got here is regarding the 10-inch record. Yes. Which you said is, is the most maligned of... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> And then I started thinking about it and I couldn't decide one because I think I've got quite a lot of 10 inch records, um, weirdly enough. But the one I went for um, is, uh, and this is quite selfish, um, yeah. is OM at, at BBC Radio 1, um, which came out on Drag City a couple of years ago. And it happened when the band was over for um, Desert Fest, I think. Was it Desert Fest they were here for? And uh, Adviatic Songs by Om is one of my all-time favourite records because I listen to a lot of records when I paint, okay. and that record is super meditative, obviously, mm. and um, and it became like soundtrack for painting for pretty much a year when it came out, and then I started using that as part, like I would listen to it when I did yoga. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, uh, so when they um, were coming over, I was like, I have to get them into Made of Ale. I need to have them do a Made of Ale session for my show. Has to happen. Um, and then we, there was a load of toing and froing, but and they really wanted to do it, but um, it meant that the date that I had, I could only get the, the dates that I had available because obviously we get allotted a certain amount of dates. Yeah. Um, I could only do it the day of the show, um, and they didn't want to do that initially. Um, 
but they were desperate to do it and I was desperate for them to do it and it managed to work out. So they went and did this session. They did um, four songs and um, literally as soon as they finished doing the session, we were contacted saying, yeah, we'd like to um, license that and release it. And I was like, please do. Yeah, quite. Um, Cause there's something very special, like um, for me to have records that were recorded for my show that I have bands that I'd got in. And it means, it means a lot to me. And, it, and at some point I've got it in my head that I'll be sat when I'm 80 mm. going, this is a record. And, uh, and this was done for the, for the rock show. And I, I, I managed to get them into this legendary studio and then played it out on my show. It's awesome. Um, so that's, that's happened, yeah. Well, not really. I just was a, an annoying person that went, can you please do this? Can you please do this? Can you please do this? I'm surprised um, they didn't ask you to join. <laughs> yeah. So um, that would have been unbelievable. But um, So, yeah. So it was a toss-up, actually, between Seven Inches, again. And it was on Live at the BBC or off Live at the BBC. Both sessions, <laughs> which, I, which I was lucky enough to have the bands do. And totally the opposite as well because off went in did i think they did 10 songs because obviously you've done peel sessions right so it's okay. same yeah. same situation in studio four and made avail which is legendary studio all the everyone from I don't know, everyone that's ever done a bbc session has played in there yeah um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i've got a sessions book amazing i don't have that i didn't know that existed yeah, it's, the reason I have it is because my name's in it. Like, and like, and and, and, and just cause, just because it's listed every single session and every person that played on the sessions. Ah, oh, no way. Did you ever do a peel session? Uh, no, I did a rock show session. At, in fact, I think I did a couple, but not peel. No. Ah, oh, so I can't look you up then. Because <laughs> nah, well, yeah. definitely wasn't cool enough. <laughs> <laughs> but um. But yeah, so as far as the 10 inches go, it was a toss up between that, which came out on Vice, um, but the on one, I think. Yeah. And before anyone goes, oh, it's not even open, he hasn't even opened it. That's because this is the cherished copy that's going to stay in there forever. And when the, when I um, first asked uh, the label to send me a copy, they were like, yeah, of course. Because um, the vinyl itself is is beautiful it's um like a green and black oh, the old split yeah nice yeah um double vinyl which is nice so one song on each side yeah um really beautiful all the all the artwork is just photos from from the studio obviously but so they sent me it and it came like that oh promo <laughs> they promoted it <laughs> Why did they do that? So you wouldn't sell it? I can't even begin to tell you how <laughs> gutted I was. <laughs> like they were like, oh, we've sent you one of the records. And I was just filled with joy until I opened it and went, what is that? Why have you done that? Total bastards. <laughs> <laughs> All the inner, inner sleeves. Oh. And I'm like, I'm not going to sell it. They yeah. recorded it for my show. What are you doing? Why have you done that? I was so heartbroken. Um, and I again, cried on an email and they sent me a nice new fresh one. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was like super heartbreaking. Just, yeah. And every everyone that's done them, and I know that they're limited runs, obviously these ones, and I know it costs money to license from the BBC. But all the other um, bands that I've had do them and that then have pressed it um, have sent me a couple and they sent me one and cut the corners off. <laughs> how, much you have but, yeah. how much does it cost to license a session? Do you have any idea? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know. I have asked a couple of times. I think it's about a grand. Right. I think. But that don't take my word for it. Um, I just asked the bands to do it and then that's about the, as much as I'm involved. 
um, other than going down there and staring at them like a weird creeper in the corner while they recorded. And did you? Um, did you, did you go I couldn't spot on. No, no. But um, for all the others, or a lot of the others, I have done. Um, but yeah, there've been some real good ones. I, I, I'm pretty chuffed with, and so yeah, Om um, Off did one. Uh, the Converge one they did as a seven inch and there's a funny story to that, that I'll tell you about afterwards um, but they they did a bunch of different um, colour variants which is cool um, Jake sent me all of those which was nice um, Behemoth uh, and they did like again a bunch of different colour variants I did the artwork for this as well which was kind of nice um, it was nice to have been asked they, they, were, they were like yeah that makes great it makes sense if you do the artwork as well. But the packaging itself is like on the thickest card I've ever seen. It's it's crazy. And it's like a weird fold out with a CD tucked in as well. And there's like prints and nice. yeah, it's really nice. Um, and they're like, like a metallic inner sleeve with the sketches and stuff. Oh, that's just the same black one. But yeah, they did a bunch of really nice um, color pressings as well so that was cool um and then baroness now have done two uh made of our sessions for me um and they've sent like that one came out in about 10 different colors as the recent one so yeah so it's nice but also i was looking whilst looking on discogs um again uh which is the devil obviously was looking at uh live at made of ale mm. and um, was trying to see if there'd been anything that had, that they'd, they'd done a vinyl pressing of that I wasn't aware of right. that had been done for my show. And I saw that Defeat, do you know Defeater? Oh, no, I don't think I do, no. Okay, so Defeater did a live at BBC Radio 1, um, 7 inch, and they put it out on Bridge 9. Oh. And I was totally unaware of it. And again, there was some nice colour variants and stuff. Um, so I messaged them and I wasn't starchy, but was a bit like, oh, it would be really nice to have a copy of this if, if you've got any left spare. And they sent me one of every colour variant again, which was amazing of them. And then I realised it wasn't for my show. <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> it was that, I think, I looked at it and I was like, oh, actually, I think they did that for uh, the punk show when Mike Davies was hosting it. Um, but so, yeah. Um, Thank you, Bridge Nine, for those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember the punk show. Yeah, what happened to that? that... Um, so Mike, so Mike did the punk show, and he also did the rock show for a little bit as well. But he was kind of doing that until they found a host for it, um, which, as it panned out, was me. But he carried on doing that after he moved back to LA. And he was doing it remotely. Um, and whilst he was doing that, it, he really wanted to train um, to be part of the fire service. Excuse me. Um, and then I think he became super focused on that. And then I don't know if the show got axed or they were talking about it. And I think the whole logistics of him doing it from LA was... Um, there was just a bunch of stuff to it, I think, and it, and it just it ended up getting um, taken off. Right. Because so you um, you cover a bit of that world if you're doing like off sessions and stuff. That that would have been on the park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In another world, wouldn't it? I'm sure. Yeah, because because rock. I mean, what is that? Do you know what I mean? It's so, and as it's it's the only show, or yeah, I, I guess officially the only show on the station that plays that kind of stuff now that um jack saunders is there he plays a lot of the kind of early doors stuff that i play as well you know the the kind of more pop punk stuff and some of the more um sort of uh more accessible stuff yeah. um so yeah there's a lot of ground for me to cover in those in those two hours now yeah. and my tastes are pretty broad so that's why the show always goes the way it does it will go from the more kind of mainstream um, kind of rock and indie rock and kind of metalcore type stuff, I guess, and then finish on, I don't know, like playing stuff like 
Alexis Marshall and Neurosis or um, Om or whatever. No, it's, it's, it's a, 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 I've listened quite a few times. It's a, it's a, it's a mixture. And the, the, you know, the fact that you play Park Chimp on there and it's often next to, I don't know, Biffy Clyro or yeah. um, Converge or something is, is, is quite nice, I think. Do you, um, yeah. So just quickly then, are you going to next year's um, Desert Fest? Uh, yeah, who is it again? I did the lineup pretty well. Um, the, 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 what, I'll tell you the band I, I, I picked out the band that I was looking forward to seeing. Yeah, is the is Elder. Oh, what a record! I love this, it's record. such a great record. Yeah, did yeah. you see them when they did the Underworld? Never seen them, so I'm really excited about seeing oh, them. As a fest. that record's amazing. Uh, yeah, I love that album. The song Sanctuary is one of the best things. Ah. Best guitar rock songs of the last whole pile of years, I think. I, I and what yeah. I really like about this record is it just flows. There's like all the songs. Are, look at that. All the songs yeah. are. Oh, all the songs I don't are, think. Um, I, hang on a minute. I don't think I've got that version. That's going to annoy me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hang on. Uh, wait. Sorry, my stuff is. I know this is really boring for anyone that is watching. But uh, people like to see people struggling looking for records. Sorry. That's going to annoy me otherwise. <laughs> so, what is yours? Clear with splatter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, that. Oh, look, mine's that. There you go. Yes, yeah, cool. oh, I like yours though. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a band that I'm looking forward to seeing, and, and um, I think that this record in particular, I love the way it's the songs are long. But they just yeah. they just flow so nicely. All the bits go together so yeah. well. You don't notice that you're eight minutes in and you're on the twenty eighth bit of the song or whatever. It's just yeah. Well, when this when this album came out, I played it a load on the show, right, right. and 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 I'd send it to my producer Carly, and she'd just be like, oh, nine and a half minutes, eh?" And I'd just be like, "Hey, I played Yob, you know," yeah. and that was like, I think I played like a that was the longest. Um, like one one track, I think was like seventeen minutes is the longest I've played on the show, which is a lot to dedicate to one band on a two hour show. But uh, yeah, yeah, you've got to occasion. But yeah, this this record, well, the band, but this record in particular is incredible. Yeah. Oh, wait, your um, label's different. Hold on, hold up. What label's huh? your one? Stickman. Oh, who's that? Armageddon. And no barcode. Yeah. That's pretty mental. I didn't realise it was on different. That's not a boot, is it? But yo, how dare you? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so great. I definitely want them to do it. Uh, did I? No, they didn't do a session. I think That's I tried it. to get them in when they were in London. I saw them play at the Underworld, yeah. and it was so great um but i had to move because there were two guys I know, i'm not even gonna say because it was really out of order i just got really shitty with them because they were just talking really loudly and talking about their friends uh, whilst this gig was playing like right there and i just went do you want to go and talk over by the bar and they got really like weirdly annoyed with me for even suggesting that because no, we're watching the band. It's like, well, you're not. You're just pissing everybody off. Anyway, <laughs> I guess here's the thing then. Uh, just in regarding people talking, I was watching this, this band here. This is another band that me and my wife are massively bonded over. So Elisa and I absolutely love the band Lungfish. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. And actually, there's two things here. Daniel Higgs's artwork is something that I think that people. Amazing. Okay. Um, yeah. Like that's kind of beautiful. But the one time I saw them was at ATP. They played ATP um, Canvas Sands. And I had to yeah. move away from someone who was talking endlessly. You're never going to guess who it was, so I'll tell you, it was the shellac drummer. He was standing right <laughs> here. He was standing right here talking to someone, like Lungfish are doing their beautiful thing up on the stage. An old shellac drummer, he'd obviously been smoking one right off because he was... He was, he was <laughs> and, and he, and talking so damn loud 
I had to walk away from him. I was like, mate. Did you not chastise him? I know you're in shellac, but shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I find it, I don't know why it annoyed me so much. Yeah. But um, yeah, that is, it's super off-putting, isn't it? Well, it's, yeah, for certain bands, it's a total bummer to have to listen to someone else talk. Yeah, yeah. Mm. especially during a band like that. Yeah. Where you just want to like totally zone out. It's the one chance you get to see him. I don't want to listen to yeah. him. Oh, the, oh, the tub thumper. <laughs> going off. Is it, t- is it Todd Train? No. Todd Train. Yeah. 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 Get him <laughs> on here and then just go. <laughs> the only reason I've asked you to do this. <laughs> <laughs> don't spoil lone fish for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, do, you, do, do you have any more records you want to show or talk about? I've got hundreds, but how many do we want? <laughs> how many do we want to talk about? I think uh, I was going to say about Horseback. Okay. Do you know that band? You uh, must know, I know them, the right? name. I know the name. I don't know the band. Uh, a, a band that I love probably way more than seems reasonable for most people that are aware of them. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it's absolutely incredible it's um it's a guy called jenks miller who he, he does a, a few other things as well i think he's done stuff from uh with or as mount moria and maybe rosie cross but um horseback is this kind of lungfish-esque maybe right, okay. not really but it has that um you put me in that anyway. kind of yeah that's a lie just said that to get you in <laughs> It's kind of um, loping, kind of looping riffs that are mm. super meditative, you know. Um, in and it has this kind of post black metal um, feel to it, and his vocals are um, on on like on this record, um, the Invisible Mountain, and some and the other early stuff, and also on Half Blood, his vocals come across almost like um like a black metal version of you know the tom waits track what's he building in there oh do you know that <laughs> where, it's, where, where it's talking about like somebody building something in his shed it's like, what's he building in there <laughs> yeah, okay yeah, the, yeah. the vocals are kind of like like this weird kind of like that yeah. but with like a weird kind of black metal kind of rasp to them over the and it's really low in the mix and um but the music is super really beautiful and hypnotic but then there's other things like there's a track on this album with the entire b-side called hate cloud dissolving into nothing (laughs) which wins points just for that but it's um just like ambient uh kind of shimmering noise right um with like these swells of of um like key parts and, and guitar parts. I I love them. But they, they started um or he it started to change quite a bit. They did a um they did an album called Dead Ringers, which was a lot more um kind of programmed and synthy and his voice became more um uh, kind of more melodic. But um yeah these records in particular um the Invisible Mountain is is untouchable. This version was on um, Andy's label, Aurora Borealis. But I think Relapse did a Relapse did a version as well, and I think another label did it as well. Put it out. Oh, but, um, that, that Aurora Borealis, they did some good shit. That's a good label. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that do you know Andy? I do, I don't think I do. No, but I know the label. So okay. Yeah. So he used to sing in in Fabric. Yeah, it's, it's all li- linked up. I was speaking to um, Pete um, Wilkins. Pete Wilkins, exactly. Who was all yeah. linked up with the South End crew? So yeah, it was... yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, that record's amazing. And that guy, the artist I said about when we were talking about um, visual artists, yeah. Dennis Falkers, Costa Mitten, he's done both of those. So they but this is his sort of pen and ink stuff rather than his paintings, but it's really striking, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, um, uh-oh, hang on, some, why, so, how are they trying to call me? That's not, 
sorry, someone was just ringing me then. And I put it it like, on a, do not like a Weatherspoon's carpet. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know how that came through. Um, but yeah, amazing records. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know them, you should. I think you'd probably really like it. I'm on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. You should have a listen. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. I mean, there's a bunch of others that I could talk about that I pulled out, but um, that is amazing. Do you have that, Spice? No, I don't know that. Uh, it's two of the guys that are in Ceremony, or are in Ceremony. That's, uh, a, re yeah, that's, a, re that's a re relapse band now, isn't it, Ceremony? Uh, yeah, I think I think the last record was, yeah. yeah. I think the last couple, yeah. Who, and they, they went from being this really kind of um, modern take on kind of people are going to be like, oh, it's nothing like that. But like a modern take on kind of um, early hardcore, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah but then they kind of morphed it. Yeah, they, they kind of became more and more kind of... Uh, um, Kind of like, I, I think they're kind of shoe games. Yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a little Joy Division esque, I guess. Um, but then, yeah, became more more like that. I do. But, um, that I do know that record. That I've, I've had checked it out when it came out, and I remember liking it quite a bit. Yeah, but this 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 is great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I did pull out some others, but no real surprises. That new Genghis Tron is incredible. Okay. Um, I was stoked that they reformed. I think that record's amazing. Um, uh, well, yeah. You might as well then, show them we're here. We're here. Just just hold them up and uh, just quickly mention them. <laughs> Young Lean, Stars. He's a Swedish hip hop artist. Um, signed to Year Zero 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 One. Um, and he started making music when I think he was like fifteen, and it was it's kind of it's hip hop, but um, but it, ha it has its very own interesting flavor to it. It's very artful. Mm. Um, and he makes other records as well. Like he does them under under his name of just, uh, Jonathan Leandoa, which is I know, a lot more, le it's less hip hop. And he also did that band called uh, Dodd Mark, All right. which was like a weird kind of lo-fi punk record as well. But um, he's incredible. Would you Would you ever play anything like that on the show? I do, yeah, I do play him on the show. Because I feel like um, it is kind of adjacent. It, if you can play, I don't know, like the more um, weirdy, experimental, artful stuff um, that that has a ha like has a foot in in what could be called rock in some format, that then kind of links together with other things from other genres that I feel. Um, have a place as well, and they're just interesting music. Um, I, I've sort of led so it that way a bit because I've, I've got a couple here that I just wanted to show quickly that I think that would fit on your show. Um, okay. And my guess, uh, and I would put money on the fact that you might have even played them. Okay. So okay. it's the uh, the clipping stuff. Yes. I, that record's great. I don't think I've actually played it yet, though. I mean, okay. That came out a while ago, didn't it? But yeah. Yeah. Sub pop, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that that record's great. Yeah, I can imagine that would yeah. spit well on the show. Yeah, for sure. Um, 100%. And, uh, the other one is this is the first record, so they've done more since, but it's the Death Grips stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think I've played Death Grips once or twice. Yeah. Um, in fact, when Simon um, from Biffy came in, he brought in a bunch of music that he wanted to play, and he wanted to play Death Grips. Uh, what's that track with Les Claypool on it? Um, but we, it was one of the ones we didn't have time for. Like we had so much music and we ended up just talking nonstop. It's, so it, loads of stuff got cut. Yeah, it's interesting this, because like he's, they, they are sampling like James Addiction and whatnot on there. Like, yeah. The, the and um, nothing shocking is on there. Yeah. And isn't, uh, is it Zach Hill plays drums in in Death Grips? The guy from um, Hella, is it? Is it the guy from that? Uh, yeah, because he's also he also played in in um, one of Chino from Deftones band as well. Is it Crosses? One of the others, I think. But yeah, it goes it goes back to the whole like Dalek can play with the laps. There's no reason why you yeah. can't play Death Grips next to Neurosis. 
like to, to me they're so similar nowadays musically yeah I, I agree and i think they've come from a similar place so for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. good <laughs> <laughs> um it's been, it's been really excellent talking yeah it's been nice it's been nice to actually like chat other than just email and yeah and whatnot yeah but yeah it's really thanks uh, for having me and well thanks for giving over way too much of your time i'm sorry sorry it's, i don't uh, even know how long how long has that been we've, we've it's about 10 minutes we've been speaking for you're fine don't worry <laughs> <laughs> that's what it feels like so yeah um so yeah you can go back and stare at your half finished canvas that's on the floor now uh, uh, <laughs> yeah i might, might do some writing today <laughs> but yeah um, i get obsessed with other bands and then have to write a record that sounds like them until i can so i can move past them yeah and i'm currently in a a terrible kind of Radiohead Jeff Buckley kind of phase. So I've just been writing, <laughs> writing loads of stuff like that. But yeah, we never, we didn't even cover the fact that you've written songs for all sorts of people. That's probably fine. <laughs> probably for the better. Well, you know, it's interesting. Though. I read, I read, I, I leave other people to look it up, but it's absolutely fascinating to me the, the world that you were yeah. in, in that. So other people can look it up, but yeah, it's quite something. Hmm. It's definitely something. <laughs> No, but it is. It's, it's quite mind blowing. Like that. I, I like the idea of uh, one of the songs being played in space. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, so people can yeah. look that up because it's really interesting. So, um, let's wave goodbye. I'll press stop, and then we can um, gossip about the bad shit for a minute before we say goodbye. Properly. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Say bye bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. <laughs>